This is Podkit, Episode 6 of What Are Ethics, on Wednesday, July 8th, 2015. And now, that's a totally recursive way to describe what X is. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Ryan Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk6. It's been a week and a half since last one. Yeah, lots of lots of things have happened since then and before, between then and now, which is awesome. Lots of stuff. For example, Ryan has some updates on the Zenfone 2, eh? I do have some updates on Zenfone 2. What 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 what, what happened over this uh, last weekend? Any uh, like uh, holidays or anything? Uh, psh, I don't know. It's like. I feel free or something, I think. Something about freedom and fireworks. What? And uh, bald eagles and American flags. And, What's and, a firework? I'm not sure. I think you put your bald eagle in it and it explodes. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, that makes sense. And then it's so the, it's the like... fuel of the of of the of the rock at the firework is on is uh, is literally ground up flags. Oh wow! <laughs> huh, I had no idea. And that that's why when it comes out. The, the part of it's red and part of it's blue. Nice. All the things they don't teach you in Boy Scouts, eh? Exactly. Yeah, huh. so did you have a good 4th of July? Yeah, my 4th my of July was awesome. Got to spend some time with family, um, had some fruit pie, some amazing fruit pie, because oh, fruit pie good. is fun. Yum. Yeah. I, I was with family, saw family every day of the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. My yeah. sister came home from Mexico, where she's sitting abroad, on Saturday, so it was good to see her. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I went down to uh, Minneapolis to watch the Minneapolis fireworks. That was pretty fun. Ooh, yeah. How was that? Well, yeah, you just answered. Yeah, awesome. it, it was actually a lot better this year because uh, I took the train down there this year with our, you know, um, folding camping chairs, and we just Ooh. sat there for an hour and a half waiting for the fireworks, just hanging out, and it was great. Nice. nice. It yeah, also I'm turns a... out that on if you try to go to campus before you go down into Minneapolis to trying to get dinner. On 4th of July, on a Saturday, everything is closed, turns out. Oh my gosh. Seriously? So like, somewhere? Even like Applebee's? Uh, like, there was no, there, there were no cars in the lot, so we assumed it was pretty closed. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's so weird. Mm-hmm. But yeah, otherwise it was great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, well, I've 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 heard that the fireworks in Minneapolis are really quite cool. Have Have you gone in the past, or is this the yeah, first we one? Yeah, uh, we went last year also. Nice. But last year, <laughs> when we went, we decided to park in this parking ramp. And being as clever as we were, we thought, hey, well, we're on, like, the eighth floor of this parking ramp. We're on the top floor. You know, every, it looks nice. We can totally see the river from here. Well, it turns yeah. out the fireworks were literally behind the building across from us, obscured. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so we could see, like, half of each explosion, and that's it. Oh, yeah, that's the worst. So this year yeah. we got a much better spot and we knew what we were doing. That's good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there was um one one of the buildings where um where people in my office sometimes work has just like a great view of the river. Yep. So there was some talk about like about like, oh maybe we should you know, jokingly, maybe we should just like all hang out really late on on the fourth of July and, and see the fireworks. But yeah, for some reason That didn't work nope. it didn't happen. For some reason, like, nobody liked that. Like, facilities didn't like it. The people who suggested it didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Know. It was know. good as a joke, but bad in real life. Yeah. Who knows? But buildings, what are those? I, hours. I Operating hours, what are those? Effort, what is that? You know, things to make sure that people are treated ethically. What, what are ethics? Get time off. Yeah, that's, that's, really the, that's really the question there. What are ethics? Yeah. What? Ethics. Mm-hmm. But yeah. any which way, I I don't know. Go park it. Oh lordy! Oh, ho, 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 we got one. Yeah, that that was a good one. That okay. was a. That so was a real... so you wanted to hear about my phone, is that right? Yeah, I was gonna say I really I really want to hear about what's 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 up with the Zen phone too because I just got my T-Mobile SIM in. Hey, there you go. The hotspot. Yeah. Right here. I just so did to, you um... did you order your SIM card from T-Mobile or did you just go get it at a store? You know, I ordered it online because they had a promo where you could actually get it for free. Excellent. So Very good. I was just like, put in a code, get free SIM card. Cool. Yeah, I feel I like um, that that free SIM card thing was part of one of the, um, what do you call their deal? Um, 
Oh yeah, uncarrier we talked movements. About the last time. Yeah, it was one of yeah. their uncarrier perks. Like, oh, why, why do all the carriers charge for SIM cards? Yeah, we don't. Yeah, something like that. Good Even for though you, they totally T-Mobile. do. Four for you, T-Mobile. Yeah, they totally do. It was like fifteen bucks a target, exactly. and I was like, that's, that's silly. Yeah. At, at three, the carrier in the UK, they were giving away SIM cards for free. Yeah, here, here, you have a SIM card. Because sorry about it, T-Mobile, but three is the original one carrier. Ooh. They yeah. don't even need the slogan to prove it. <laughs> no, they're just three times better. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So here's the Zenfone 2. I've got nice. it here in my hand. It's uh, it's running. It's going. And actually, as we sit here, the porting process is running. Nice. Allegedly. So says Straight Talk website. <laughs> it says port in progress. So I think I've had it for about a week now. And yeah. it's not my phone, it's my mom's phone, but of course, uh, knowing knowing me and being in charge of phones here, I'm the one who's leading the progress here. Yeah. And so I've installed all of her favorite apps, which includes barely any apps, because on nice. her current phone, she really can't use many apps because she has no space. Yeah. You know, 8 gigabytes is not a lot. But on the Zen Phone 2, 64 gigabytes of storage, just, just oh my ready gosh. to go. And uh, 54 of that was available to the user after all of the updates and stuff for, you know, built-in apps. But 54 gigs is a lot. She's not going to be filling that up anytime soon. No, totally. And uh, I put a 64 gig uh, SD micro SD card in for pictures and video. And uh, tons of that is still available. 57 gigs of that is available. Um, You know, everything is really great about the phone. Everything feels really fast. Uh, you know, Android has this notorious issue with scrolling speed or scrolling performance jitter. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and in general, the Nexus 6 probably stutters more. Hmm. That's pretty sad to say. Um, mm-hmm. so like switching apps is really fast. Uh, if you have ever heard of the Nexus 9, that is the Nvidia tablet. Oh, I'm trying to call someone now, huh? That is the Nvidia tablet, the Nexus 9. And the problem with the Nexus 9 is when it came out, and even till this day, the Tegra K1, I think, is the processor yeah, in it. Yeah, I think it, you're right, the K1. It legs a lot. Uh, switching apps takes pretty much forever. Um, at least one or two ice ages pass between app switching. And, you know, among other things, uh, this phone has 4 gigs of memory, so you'd assume that it can take tons and tons of concurrent app openings and not suffer any like slowdowns for clearing up memory or garbage collection or anything. And it doesn't seem to. That's awesome. And nice. this phone has the uh, 5.0 memory leak problem. So even though the operating system is leaking like a sieve, it has plenty <laughs> of memory to handle it. Like, that's so great. Yeah. Like that, It is pretty that's, great. That's That seems like the case of the manufacturer really like understanding what the heck needs to be done and or just putting the most you know, awesome specs that can fit into into uh, an x86 based you know, <laughs> emulating arm on the fly Android phone. That's that is something. I mean, it really is something. It, it seems fast. Every all the apps that I've tried works just fine. Um, so right now I can't give you like a speed test because I am currently in the porting process and my SIM card is currently unactivated. Yeah. But. Uh, I was testing last week with the Nexus 5 on Straight Talk, and this week I was testing with this phone on Straight Talk. And for the most part, this has better signal quality than the Nexus 5. Oh wow! Which is funny. Sounds better in every way. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, I think it might be. So the one thing I don't have conclusive results on is the battery life, and it's really hard to test battery life because my usage patterns are weird because I'm playing with the phone instead of just using the phone. Yeah. And of course, I have my Nexus 6, and of course, even if I got usage for me, it wouldn't be what my mom will use the phone like, so it's kind of hard to tell. So I'll, I'll tell you about the battery life further along, but I will tell you that if you leave the phone, uh, if you use the phone like you might typically use your own regular phone, it probably will last you easily a day and a half. Oh, wow. And if you don't use your phone, like, you literally just let it sit there and shun it and maybe check it once every couple hours, it'll last, like, th- two or three days. Nice. That's awesome. And uh, I would have to say that's pretty great. Yeah, that sounds pretty darn amazing. Now, there is this one time, though, that <laughs> I put the phone in my pocket and 
just just forgot about it, wasn't playing with it, you know, went off to do other things. And then I come come back to it two and a half hours later, and I noticed that it lost 45% of its battery doing nothing. Well, that was pretty weird. I did a quick restart, and uh, that weird battery draining issue went away. Huh. So sometimes there just might be little weird quirks, you know, it could have just been an app going crazy or something. I don't know. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Very, very weird. Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, one more thing about the phone, or it's really about Straight Talk. So the way T-Mobile does porting of numbers is you get a SIM card from T-Mobile, and then you can just port a number in, and whatever number was on that SIM card before just vanishes, and you get your old one back somehow. That's how uh-huh. I thought the porting process here for Straight Talk would work. Well, apparently you can only port in a number upon activation, which is kind of sucky if you want to test the service first. Yeah. Well, so I contacted customer service, and they can do it. It's just not an automated process, which I guess is fine. Um, but you need – you still, even if you want to port in a number, you need a new SIM card. Like, I guess for some reason they can't change the phone number of a SIM card, which is really weird. That is really weird. Like that seems like it defeats the purpose of the entire SIM card point thing. They're yeah. Tiny things though, so it's probably to save space. They made it read on, or write only or something. But T-Mobile can do it, so I don't understand why Straight Talk slash AT and T can't. SIM cards are so tiny. I have a hard time imagining how they even work. Eh. Solid state memory is cool like that. Yeah, I suppose. So what I did, and this is like super hacks. Now, if you recall last week, I told you like there's like eight SIM cards in that package. Yeah. Well, in each package, it comes with a micro and a nano AT&T SIM card among the other vendors. So what I did last week is I put the uh, the the micro in, and so that's what I was doing the testing number on to see what the service is like. Well, now that we want to do the port, what I did is I used my old nano SIM to micro SIM adapter and put the nano SIM in, and I'm using that for the new number, the porting number. That's hmm. awesome. So I didn't have to spend ten dollars to get a new SIM card. Ha ha! What now? Just straight talk. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. No, that's so cool. Well, it's 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 cool to hear both both your your thoughts on the phone and and on the network too, because like I I never really thought that an Asus phone would be a thing, and now that it's a thing, you know, I mean it's it's been a thing for some time, of course, because this is the Zenfone two, not just the Zenfone one. Well, the Zenfone like, one was kind of a joke phone. Like it had awful specs, awful screen. Whatever yeah. deal they cut with themselves and Intel, this is like leagues better. No, totally. And like, didn't didn't they have something before that was called like the Pad Phone, and everyone oh, made yeah. fun of it? Yep. Because pa- it was like... Pad Phone, Phone Pad, and of course they had the Zen Phone three, four, and five. Wait, so the Zen Phone five is already out? So this, yeah. And not only that, occasionally you will see. That the Zen phone with an F and the Zen phone not with an F exist also separately and not separately. Wow, how how far apart are all these releases? Oh my gosh, they've happened over the last couple of years. I, okay, you know because they were never really a big contender with the good phones, you know, like the Galaxy phones and the HTC One phones and the Nexus phones. I never really paid attention to them before, but now that they don't, um have terrible specs, I guess it's kind of nice to pay attention to them. This is like, oh my gosh, yeah, brain hurting. Yeah. Oh, lordy. It's like, you know, it, stuff like that is why I, like, the Apple model, I mean, well, Apple, of course, has some model number issues, but, um, but like, at, at least, at least it's like... Okay, here, so I've got a yeah. full, I've got a full list of, of Asus phones. They just released this, in fact, a couple of days ago, the Pegasus 2 Plus, because that doesn't even have the word Zen in it. But then you have okay. the Zenfone 2, Zenfone 2, Zenfone 2, Zenfone Selfie, Zenfone 2, oh, Zenfone no. 2, Zenfone C, Zenfone 5, Zenfone Zoom, another Zen 2, Zenfone 5 LTE, Zenfone 4, Zen, or Padphone S, Padphone Infinity Lite, Pegasus <sighs> X002, Zenfone 5, Padphone X, Padphone Mini, Padphone 4, Padphone 6 even, Padphone 5 again, Padphone Infinity 2nd Generation, Padphone <laughs> Note, FDH6, Padphone Infinity, and finally, the Padphone Mini 4.3. Oh man, that reads like the uh, the iPod 
you know, if you just look at the straight old iPod, iPod first, second, third, fourth, yes. fifth generation. But it's many, funny because those are not in order. Like, first, second, third generation, those are in order, but these were not. Yeah. Yeah. So it adds a whole other, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's unbelievable. And cool. Just just imagine and from a consumer standpoint, like, hey, yeah. I want to get the newest Asus phone. Is that the Zenfone 6 then? No, actually, no. the newest one is the Zenfone 2. Sorry. The Zenfone 6 was the first one. Yeah. That was the first one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you just can't oh win. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, lordy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Cool. Good for... Good for good for Asus then to make that happen. And thanks for the thanks for the pronunciation there. I I never actually said it out loud until this podcast, which is a fun thing you learn on podcasts because yeah, you know, for weeks I had been calling it the Zen Phone with a PH, but now it's a Zen Phone with an F. <laughs> and I yeah. I had to train myself to stop doing it wrong. How do you how could you ever get those mixed up? They're so different. <laughs> I, I had no idea. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> So I have some phone follow-up. I've in yeah. my further investigation for studying abroad. Yeah. There. So since I will be there over 180 days, which is what the tourist visa is for Denmark, I will oh, apply yeah. for a visa there, which will be in the first couple weeks after I arrive, which is fine. Um, but I for cell phones there are. Many, most carriers require you to have a CPR number, which is comparable to a social security number here in the U.S. Yeah. So that rules out most of plans. So there's an American one where I could get, you know, a, I don't know, 10 gigs of data, I don't know, 20 hours of calling or 10 or something, unlimited texts. I think I could even call home for really cheap for like $90 a month, and that's charged in U.S. dollars. And that's, that's actually like kind of a lot. There are yeah. less plans, but two gigs of data, and I kind of want more. But so yeah. there's another plan that does not require the CPR number. It's only for in Denmark. It's I think 10 hours of calling. It's per pay per month, um, unlimited texting within Denmark, and four gigabytes of data for what translates or what converts to $19 a month. Yeah, that's pretty good. What? That sounds awesome. So that's hopefully what I'm gonna go for if all yeah. goes well. So yeah, that's and so. And have cool. LTE and. Cities area in in Denmark. So when you're there, are yeah. you gonna leave Denmark at all to go sightseeing or anything? Or are you just stick, yeah, sticking? Yeah, I'm going in? to Norway for a few days yeah. as part of a class. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go to Sweden once or twice to see my cousin. Um, nice. I'll probably travel around. That sounds good. I have a couple of breaks. I have some other friends who might be over in Europe. So that's so cool. Yeah. Um. This. So I don't mean to derail this and put this back on the cell carrier, but um. <laughs> Uh, are, d- does that, like, like, okay, so you're, what you're talking about there is like contract plans, right? Or not really contract plans. The one I just described was a per month. I think you, you make an account, you yeah. order a SIM card, you, they mail it, and you buy like cards and gas stations. Yeah, yep. At your yeah. account. Kind of so thing. it's, it's like pay as you go, but it's not really pay as you go, it's just prepaid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pretty- Gotcha, gotcha. Because pay as you go would be like, here's another two gigs of data, but it's you're you're paying for it before you get the service. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Because I was. Yeah. It's it's. I think they might have called different options, but for the student one with a little package, that's what I saw. Yeah. Nice. It's just kind of weird that they. Well, it, I guess if if you're looking at like contract stuff, it kind of makes sense that you want to their equivalent of a SSN, a CPN number. Yeah, it makes sense. But but I don't know. Oh, it's, that's cool that you found good options there. And oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna the pod kit is going to change dramatically because uh, well, we'll be we'll be recording it probably weird hours. And uh, we're gonna go international. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're gonna go international, and it's World's gonna be first, awesome. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's gonna be so cool. Yeah. So on a different note. Um, in my ever ever going troubles with Windows that I have over my whole life, so I'm copying stuff from my server via I don't know whatever Samba or whatever it is. Yeah. The actual hard drive. Apparently Windows caches all that on your computer, and now I have zero bytes free on Windows, and I don't know where it's storing it, and I can't download any application or anything to investigate it. That is horrible. This this happened to me once before, but I had at least enough megabytes to in to install something on it to 
C. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Windows. You'd think it would cache it. <laughs> I just think it's kind of funny, because it. No, totally. I don't know. I'm browsing my, my app data folder right now. You probably won't get too much in there. But I'd imagine they'd put it in my user account thing. It's probably some system cache thing somewhere. Yeah. I mean, Windows is not the um, most logical of places, so if you think it's somewhere, it's probably not. <laughs> yes, that's true. Also, um, well, we'll talk about this later. Hey, Ryan, you want to talk about Wargame? Oh yeah, sure, have... sure, war game. Hey, you know everyone. You know I, I every every few months I just boomerang back to this horrible thing I've been doing for like five years. Ah, the good old war game. Here we are again, in Rust again. Rust is what I named my cat after, but it's Ooh. also this programming language that's supposed to be for systems and really secure and really really great for safety and stuff. And fun. And and a lot of fun, uh, mostly. Uh, unless you have to deal with uh, weird borrowing rules because of rustiness. Well, so this time I have upgraded the Rust War Game because between December of 2014 and now, the language has gone from version 0.13 to 1.1. <laughs> and as you can imagine, things have changed. Lots of things totally. have changed. Um, so name package names have changed um syntax has not really changed too much but uh type names have even changed uh, oh my gosh it, it used to be u int and now it's u size uh hmm. and i think that is a fair change because u int sounds a lot like unit and um when you're typing fast it's easy to get those things confused yeah so uh there was a lot of changes and i finally figured out how to uh reconcile those things and pretty much everything ported really easily over it was mostly just name changes and package changes so that was good um i've also upgraded the way the war game i don't know determines how long it needs to run so before uh-huh. it was doing this thing where if a t- uh, where if you had a faster running war game it would look for periods of time where it didn't change a lot uh-huh and that sort of worked, but it also turns out was not scalable for Rust. Because this worked really well in Java, because Java was really slow, and as far as I could tell in my testing, really computers couldn't go for more than, you know, 38 war games per millisecond. And that meant that you didn't have to wait more than 40 millisecond, or 40 seconds, uh, for a period of stability. Well, in Rust, it goes a lot faster. On my computer here, uh, the one I'm recording on, I can get um, one or 108 war games per millisecond. Nice. So it's much faster. Using yeah. the same system, though, I would have had to wait 108 seconds for the stability test. And that's only if it succeeded, because if it failed, it'd have to do it again. Yeah. So I changed the algorithm, and so now we're doing something a little bit more maybe scientifically and statistically relevant. So I'm using what is known as the coefficient of variation. You can tell all your professors Yay. about that, right? I do know about the coefficient of variation, even though I did not take statistics. That's awesome. So so basically, the coefficient of variation... Oh my gosh, it sounds so horrible to be saying things like this. Basically, it is the ratio of standard deviation to mean. And what my program is doing is it is checking for when the ratio is approximately 1%. So in other words, when is the standard deviation 1% of the mean? And the reason this might be better than what we had before is if a computer is really jittery in its speed, so it's cooling down, it's heating up, it's throttling, or maybe even you're doing something with the computer, you're interacting yeah. with it, stealing cycles away from the war game, it'll punish you by making it uh, take longer. Um, I, th- so it's pretty cool. Um, it, it's looking for 1% uh, standard deviation to mean. So if you get a score of, or if your speed is like 30 games per millisecond, the standard deviation between those game speeds should be somewhere around 1%. Nice. Ideally. Cool. 
Um, so we were we were doing some tests earlier. So my computer gets 108. Um, uh-huh. Your computer gets 22. Oh, that was an, right. an i7 MacBook Air. Uh, my That's MacBook right. Air gets around 20. Um, where, where were you getting, Brian? My MacBook Pro running a, a i7 3820QM, which is a quad-core type of threading, uh, scores a 23 when running Windows. Um, and then my desktop, which is a 4770K that's not overclocked, running OS 10 while doing Hangouts, the fringe, ton of tabs, and not in an ideal state at all, uh, scores a 37. So those numbers nice. are really strange to me because I feel like you should be getting, be getting way higher numbers. Yeah, like I just finished running it on my um, A6 um, from a couple of years ago, my AMD A6. And uh, with with four threads, because that's a thing, I think. Yep. Um, it uh, scored 18, which is worse than my MacBook, but only slightly, which is essentially my experience with this computer built in general. So you know, it'd be awesome. kind of interesting. So, like, I don't have the numbers from what you guys have run previous the the Java version on. Yeah. But the gulf between performance between the Java version and the Rust version is huge. Like, my computer was getting uh. 30 on the Java version and it gets 108 on the rest version. That's, that's huge. Totally. Were you running Windows or Linux or? Uh, yeah, that was that was Windows. Hmm. Um, I'll just try that on my desktop. On uh, on the Linux computer, I think I was getting an 8 on the um, Linux computer and then I was getting a 20 on the on the Linux or no, actually a 30 on the Rust version. So 8 hmm. to 30 is pretty big. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, just just native performance, man. Everybody should get some. I think, uh... On my MacBook Pro, I don't think I did that bad on the Java version, but it seems a lot worse with Rust. Right. So it uh, makes Windows. you wonder. Yeah. Yeah, Windows is bad. Nobody should use Windows. So the Windows has a system disk cleanup section, which, of course, doesn't find this cache. Of course not. Sounds right. And so now, of course, I Google search Explorer, but that means Internet Explorer. So. <laughs> Windows Explorer. And, oh, and Internet Explorer is still up there. Clear your cache. So, dear listeners, if you would like to, I don't know, uh, verify my scientific and st- statistical prowess and tell mm-hmm. me if this is good or not, uh, feel free to let me know. I will put a link to the actual source code for this particular part of the test uh, into our show notes. It, it, You know, it's not a very complicated test, and it's almost more elegant than what I had before, but... It does mean that it's also still almost completely arbitrary. Arbitrary, but also awesome. Yeah, like it, I mean, it is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it was so much fun. I, I don't know if I mentioned on the show before, but um, for a little while there last January, I tried to port this to Node.js. Yeah. Which is literally, in uh, on, on the face of it, just totally ridiculous. However, there is a, a fork of Node.js, or... Um, a project that's inspired by Node.js in some way called JX Core. Um, that's X as in Xavier, the dude from X-Men. Oh, wow, that's totally a recursive way to describe what X is. But anyway, anyway <laughs> mark it, I guess. Um, the, the, um, it, it's, it's a multi-threaded version of Node, sort of. And I'm not really sure how it achieves it, but in my testing, basically, it's still essentially unusable for it. I'm going to keep trying at it now that it's halfway through the summer and I have some more breathing room to to try out stuff like that. So that should be really fun um, if that ever happens. But it's, it's so it's been so cool to pour over your source, co- source code in the Java version and in the Rust version well, to see not, just like I, I what the f- heck you're doing there. I feel like I might have to redo the Java version, especially with this new you know uh, statistical yeah. analysis change. Um, mostly because it, it would make sense to um, do you know do the same thing in both places. But honestly, it doesn't really matter what the stuff is in general because the priming time, the 60 seconds of running before any testing begins, basically that tells you what the score is going to be. I mean, it very rarely changes. So, yeah. Totally. Um, I was also looking, you know, since you mentioned the, the Node.js version, I was looking at ASM.js. And if you uh-huh. have ever heard of ASM.js, it's basically a subset of JavaScript that is super performant. And it's what a lot of um, of demo work Mozilla has done to show how um, the future of JavaScript is JavaScript. And so is the future of everything else. That's awesome. ASM, 
was used in that joke talk about mm -hmm. how everything will compile into JavaScript. Yeah. yeah. And he pronounces it JavaScript all the time. Uh, yeah. Oh, Brian, that I was not it. a joke talk. That was a real talk. Uh, I need to watch it again. <laughs> it was real. Um, it's going to happen. The one, the one where you're running Windows 3. Point, or like Firefox inside In of Firefox. To run Windows. Windows 3.1 <laughs> inside of Firefox. Exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. That talk. And it was the, uh, the I think, the Mac version of Firefox, which means they're somehow doing some giant emulation of OS X at the same time. Oh, of course they are. Unless they just have Firefox written in JavaScript. But don't worry, there won't be any drivers. <laughs> There's yeah. no need. No need for the drivers. No need for drivers. Yeah, so that's that's Rust, uh, the war game. Uh, so, of course, I might have to do it in C++, because, uh, you know, I, I feel pretty compelled. I, of course, I have to redo the Java version, so you can expect all of that to come out sometime. Nice. Yeah. All right. That's so awesome. Well, uh, one of the things that I've kind of been struggling with, and I know I didn't put this into the into the show notes doc, but um, one of the things that I've been struggling with at work actually is doing vertical alignment. So I'm I'm really excited about this next item too. I'm excited about all these items because it's just really cool to talk with you guys. Yeah. But yeah. also this one in particular, um, vertical alignment of CSS um, using only three lines. Um, basically, it looks like what it's doing is it's setting position to relative, then putting it. To, um, Setting top to 50%, so it starts the top lower. Is that is that is that what I'm seeing by 50%? Like halfway down the page, essentially halfway down the viewport. That's what. Then, top, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, so. and then it's using transform to um, undo that again by 50%. Is that right? I think so. <laughs> That's so cool. I, it, clearly, it's a hack. Uh, so the, the oh, show sorry. notes uh, link here is from. 063, uh, this guy presumably has, uh, of course, why would the person put their name on any of their, you know, web pages, right? Why, why would that ever be a thing? Nah. Sebastian X Strom? Strom? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, these three lines of code, it's pretty great. It, it seems to work generally well. Um, they even have a SAS version, uh, for a mix that you can use in your own code. Yeah. Uh, you know, I th the the problem with vertical alignment is that why isn't it literally just built into C CSS now? Who knows? I, I mean, how didn't anybody making CSS3 not decide to put it in? Maybe because all the all the implementations they've ever seen of it's some like hacks, and they're like, well, we should wait until somebody figures out a non-hacky way to do it. But but that the the problem is there is no <laughs> non-hacky way to do it because it's not because in the standard. Because somebody built it in the language. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so man, that's recursive. Just put in a table view and vertical no, alignment. No, no tables. Actually, that's what I tried first and it still didn't work. Oh, I hate it. Yeah. So the reason I had to do this um, vertical align thing is what I normally do for vertical alignment is I don't. Uh -huh. And um, when I do want something to be sort of centered in the page, I kind of just eyeball it and just guess, oh, that looks like 7Ms. I think I'll just use 7Ms padding. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. 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 And so it turns out I was making this JavaScript clock, and I'm kind of staring at it right now because that's what tells me how many minutes are remaining in this episode. And on mobile, 7Ms is very, very, very different than 7Ms on desktop. So that wasn't yeah. a good solution. And I could have used JavaScript maybe somehow to look at the page, look at the size of the elements, do some subtraction, mm -hmm. do some multiplication, and align it correctly using absolute. But that's not cool. Yeah. So uh, the CSS did work, uh, and I do not support IE9 at all, so uh, no loss there. Right. So you use M, you should be using REM. Yep, is... I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> oh, it's funny you mention that, because I actually do use REM, but nobody knows what REM is, so I still say M. Okay. I've it's been uh, at work, I've been using right? uh, your view height and view width, VH, uh, you know, yep, you. Yep, Because... It's gonna. The final product will be on a 1080p display, but uh, before that, will be presented on a Microsoft Surface. So. Oh, that's cool. It needs to somewhat scale. Are you going properly. to? Uh, you should uh, try to make your 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 business there. Uh, just you know, temporarily rent a uh, perspective pixel to test on. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That'd be nice. So. Um, my update on my where's my uh, solid state storage. The um, 
users, my home folder, app data, local Microsoft Windows folder has 38 gigabytes in it. Oh, wow. Uh, that's as far as I am. Nothing is really showing, at least date modified. And, of course, size doesn't update on any of these. Yeah. So uh, everything updated today is under 100 megabytes. Yeah, wow. somehow that folder is 38 gigabytes. Well, that doesn't sound suspicious at all. So then maybe there is, it's just appending to a file that is already existing. That seems funky to do it that way, though. Yeah. Huh. Oh, Windows Anytime Upgrade has a folder. <laughs> well, it sounds like you can upgrade at any time. Yeah, they reserve the space for the versions of Windows you don't have always. It was like three kilobytes. That'd be terrible. Oh, oh, that's good. That's good. At least it's only three kilobytes. Yeah, that oh, awesome. man, if there were four. Well, it probably takes up four, because that's probably what... Well, this isn't Unix. It doesn't use inodes. Yeah. Or oh. does it? I don't know how Windows works. I actually have no idea how Windows does their file system, and I don't know if I want to know. Yeah, it, it sounds really scary, to be honest. Oh, man. So, that, uh... scary HFS Plus is where over time things will get corrupted. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's about as equally as scary as that, actually. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Windows does not have native support for path names more than 260 characters is a sign that e- either <laughs> A, nobody uses their computer for anything important, or B, Microsoft is insane. Possibly both. Yeah, probably. So if you guys want to take a, um, a quick detour into Linux sysadmin land... Oh, I would love to. do um, I don't know what that was. That was like the Mario pipe music. Any which way. Oh, lordy. Oh, Got hey. it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, th- there's, there's nothing for it. I, I cannot be helped. Anyway, my, uh, um, the, uh, tower that I'm using right now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to do a file system check at every boot. Ugh. And I think that's just ever since I upgraded it. Well, uh, upgrade is a, is an interesting word for it. Um, ever since I changed to using System D instead of uh, SysV in it, um, hmm. which is probably a thing because um, the distro I was using, um, well, it's it's essentially Debian. Um, it's Crunchbang, which is no longer with us, which is sad. Um, but the the maintainer is off to do other things like live his life, which is cool. Um, but the uh, the the system behind it, of course, is still Debian, and when Debian switched to System D, so did my computer, um, and it's been doing a bunch of weird stuff ever since. I think because all of the packages that are set up were maintained by this one, um, this one other person. So the the UI, a lot of the UI packages were maintained by this one person and people he worked with, right, or, mm-hmm. um, to to maintain this distro. Basically, they haven't been updated in a while. So I'm thinking about just like moving everything to a backup drive and disconnecting the backup drive and reflashing the whole thing with Fedora or Ubuntu or both or neither. Who knows? I'll, I'll have to see. But like, have you guys ever heard of that? Like, have you ever had a Linux machine that did a file system check on boot? Like every time. Every single time. Uh, it happens to me on Windows. Does that count? <laughs> it maybe happened to me with OS 10 and caused 10 minute boot times for a year. Yeah. So there's no way to cancel it for you? For me? Yeah. No, I, well, not that I know of. It it doesn't. It, it's not accepting user input at that time. It's just that's, printing stuff out of the screen. That's pretty bad. Yeah, hmm. I mean, I hope it's not that one of my drives is is gone, but it doesn't seem to have this problem on any of the other OSs I have on here, like elementary or mm-hmm. um, Start Ubuntu. That is still an OS I need to install. Elementary. Oh, it is so nice. It's it's definitely like um, the best theme for XFCE that I've ever seen. I would not pick any other XFCE theme after seeing Elementary OS. Um, okay. I know that that community has kind of had some trouble uh, recently, one way or another. But yeah, uh, like they had some issue with documentation. I feel like, or no, it wasn't documentation. It was something like that. Hmm. But um, but it's it's cool that they're still doing it. Um, maybe the issue is that they were like soliciting donations in a way that made people uncomfortable, I guess. But Oh yeah, they they yeah, they had a download button that said ten dollars and then you you know you'd have to click or change it to zero to download it for free. Oh man, that was the worst. Yeah. But they're they they have their their bugs are totally in a bounty system too. It's kinda interesting. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it, but it's, oh my gosh, it's so darn pretty. And they have it, they picture it here running on some sort of, I, I don't even know what machine it's, it's running, but oh my gosh, if, it looks like a MacBook, but it's not a MacBook, and it just looks too darn good. That's for sure. I have an old 32 gig solid state laying around that hasn't done anything since it was the drive for my Minecraft server. I yeah. should uh, flash that so that's not gonna happen again, and uh, boot it up and USB boot it on my MacBook to see how it looks. Yeah, totally. Totally. I, I want to find that video where they have where they have it set up. It looks like they're almost all using using it on Macs, which is really funny. <laughs> yeah. The it, the diehard not... Apple fanboys that are just more Unix, or they're more Linux diehard than Apple. Yeah, that's so awesome. Like that's that's so cool. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be stuck in a rabbit hole if I keep looking at this. So that's just gonna be minimized. <laughs> but um, yeah. No, those Linux, Linux, Linux distros, distro wars, distro um, distro something. It it yeah. All that stuff. Discos, not distros, is a thing that nobody should say. But that just came out of my face for some reason. Um, yeah, so Linux is a thing, and there aren't drivers for it. That's we right. Well. Not, no drivers whatsoever. Um, but earlier in this week, yeah, that's still technically this week, um, I had kind of an interesting revelation about package managers. So I was trying to prototype a really quick site for a domain that I purchased a while back but haven't done anything with yet. Um, and I realized that, um, well, let me step back. When I was thinking about the tools that I wanted to use to build this site, right, I was using, um, first First, I knew I wanted to use um, SAS because I SAS would allow me to manage the CSS in what I felt would be a pretty reasonable way. Mm-hmm. And I learned about um, that grid framework that we talked about a while. I, I know it as Susie. Um, Sussy for me. Sussy. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Susie. Sussy. Who knows? Pronunciation is weird. Um, but the uh, I wanted to use Sussy too. And then I was like, well, yeah, I, I kind of want to test it um, with... Um, you know, have have it running in a in a window that would refresh alongside me here, mm-hmm. and then I learned about this Node package called uh, Browser Sync that I've been absolutely addicted to for work for about um, uh, two weeks now. Um, Browser Sync is really quite cool. You just um, it, it's it acts as like a gulp task kind of, or I guess you could probably use it as a grunt task too, or any other sort of task runner you want. Um, and what it does is every time you save, it will not only do the thing where it dumps the caches, so so when you reload, it'll work. But it will actually automatically reload the browser for you, which like it, cool. it's all done in it's all done in client side JavaScript. This is injecting to your page, so it's nothing like super intense. But have you ever that. used uh, Nodemon or Nodemon? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I I use that too. But the th- the thing that um I, well I, I hadn't been able to get that to work with um um. I hadn't been able to get it to automatically refresh the window in place, right? I, I had used that before, but I always had to automatic or I always had to refresh it manually when I switched to the page. Hmm. Did they have did they have an auto refresh thing too? And I just missed it. Um it doesn't well it, it auto refreshes the page if you save a file. Browser sync like will sync your session between devices. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Yeah. That doesn't do no. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's that's right. That's probably a better way to put what I'm what I'm going after here. So like, I'll test it on like my um my phone, my iPad, and stuff. And and there's a way that if you just go to the if you just go to the the link that Browser Sync gives you, it will sync any device that you're viewing it on because it's pointing at that one server. Um, that that Browser Sync is kind of hijacked. Um, and and it'll reload it all for you at the same time, which is just so many degrees of awesome. And it was like absolute lifesaver when I was debugging something for work this past week that no none of my browsers were having but but somebody else was reporting this 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 issue and I was like, oh how's it gonna work? And browser sync fixed it. Um but so I, I really wanted that too. Um but then I realized that I was using um you know SAS SAS plugins, SAS mixins. I was using some Ruby build depths, right? So I was I was I was using um of course, like SAS. I think I had Compass mixed in there too for um, for 
sussy slash Suzy purposes. And uh, then I realized, too, that for all my client-side stuff, um, you know, jQuery, thought about using Foundation, um, you know, and, and, of course, Grunt and Gulp. Um, well, in my case, Gulp. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then I realized on top of that, too, that in order for Gulp to work, I had to install um, some other build that's using Homebrew. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait a sec. This is ridiculous. I'm using six layers of package managers, and it's really getting me nowhere for this page I wanted to really prototype in 45 minutes. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm moving more towards Brian's camp of pack, package manager skeptics. Um, I don't know if I'm a skeptic. I'm just like, you know, sometimes this gets a little bit too complicated. Yeah. I've always been a package manager fan. I think it's super fun. You can download a little bit and then just do some stuff and then pff, it's all there. No, totally. Like I, I I definitely see the value in package managers, but gosh, when like in, in my case I I felt like I was building I was building a system, right? Mm-hmm. I was where no system was necessary. This was this was in my in my estimation a one off project. Uh, that I'd probably redo later to do better, and at that right. point, I'd love to. I'd love to build up the system, right? But um, for this little one-off product, I just wanted to see if I could make it work in in half an hour or whatever. Oh man, following the maze of unmet dependencies yep. back down back down to homebrew, right? It was it was too much. So the the tweet that's in the show notes there is is the conversation that resulted as part of it. However, I do now have some really awesome. Kind of minimal, but really awesome um, gulp uh, gulp files yep. that I just have in a repo uh, hanging out on on our enterprise GitHub. So um, so whenever I need a new project, I can just get clone that and exactly. go from there. Which nice. oh my gosh, it's so fabulous! I so love, are you doing like, like a concat and uh, uglify and all those things? You bet, you yep. bet. Mm-hmm. Auto prefixer, yep. yep. The whole nine yards. Yeah, you know, it's the package manager thing is great and it works really well. But you know, when you, it's especially when you just want to sit down, and especially when you're just designing the site, you're not really making like any hardcore functionality. You yeah. just want to sit down and plug in some styles. You don't want to do all this extraneous stuff, and that's when the package manager weight feels really burdensome. And that's what yeah. I usually have the problem with. It's not so much that you can just do cool stuff with it. It's that it feels really heavy for doing these really tiny things that really should be almost effortless. Yeah, totally. And like the, I guess the other side of that too is maybe perhaps what I should do is sit down on a weekend and set up this like really basic platform that's like okay, it's got SAS, it's got um, it's got jQuery ready for me. Yeah. And, I and thought of is, doing that. I don't basic. know if it's gonna work though. Yeah, right. But then, but then, anytime you want to try a new thing, you have to redo the entire setup yep. so that it includes that new thing. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, there, there's a way that it's somewhat modular. But I mean, even even then, like if if you're if I mean, what if you want to find something that's not jQuery? What if you want to use like Zepto or something instead of it? Exactly. Um, in fact, then, I'm using Zepto in my thing here, and yeah. it's easy to change things out because you know you just drag and drop a file. But that's why it's so easy. What I did in this uh, clock app is I have all of the files that I want in JavaScript. I actually yeah. have those as files and not as separate packages through Node or whatever you people use these days. <laughs> and that makes it so much easier for me to manage. And it's not so much that it can't manage it as a package manager, but I have no idea how to manage them. Yeah, totally. Nice. Yeah. I, I like package managers like that because you get updates as time goes on, so it's really easy to get new features. Totally. Power update and you're done. Totally. Uh, and then also, you know, if they have new improvements, but yeah, then it's more to manage. Um, here's my opportunity to plug Yeoman and the, the wonderful Angular full stack project. It's got yeah. everything set up. You just go, and then it just auto-installs all your node and Bower stuff. So the initial start is maybe five minutes, but after that, the golden, and you're all there. However, yeah. I think there's also value in setting up your own project from scratch sometimes. I'm still struggling with my BrianM.me one. Uh, MongoDB is hard when I don't know what I'm doing. And I've depended on a generated project for the last year. No, totally. Like, Mo- Mongo, too. I, I know that 
that that that platform has had some difficulty of late with like just having some weird glitchy stuff that you wouldn't expect from a database that's supposed to be backing important critical things. Um, mm-hmm. So I like it's it's definitely not just you and I know I've I've had trouble with it in the past too, but um, it's also for me I would definitely say to an even greater extent it's extent it's because I don't know what I'm doing. But um, do no, I, like do, that. Do any of us know what we're doing? I also think like I've I've used these generated stuff because I think it's it's really easy to start off very quickly, oh. and you can just quick modify a few things because if you see something that works, you can easily tell what you can change and how yeah. it will affect it. Yeah. For the most part, but when you're starting from scratch, like I don't, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around Express sometimes, and just like having it all set up and. I, I sat down this last weekend for an hour or two to try and poke around with some and didn't make very much progress. And mm-hmm. I, I still haven't been able to even get some demo thing out of Mongo on my client, but I'll get there eventually. Yeah, no, you'll totally get there. Like, um, yeah, we should definitely at some point talk about um, what uh, what client library you're using for Mongo because I know that's a big deal in the in the Node world. Like Mongoose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's all that I've ever used. I think mongoose is the right one. I think it. I, I think yeah, it's got to be the right one. That's yeah. the only one I've ever heard of. Um, yeah, appa- apparently there have been like dozens, and they've like died out. Like yeah, I'm sure um, there are hipster ones, but mongoose yeah. is the the long yeah. champion. Yeah, totally. Nice. Well, yeah, you'll you'll totally rock it. Like once 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 you get some more brain space to. To make it happen. Yeah. At this rate, maybe I'll finish by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> so are, are you still thinking about, or are, are you still working through the uh, the uh, static generated ones too? So on one hand, it's it's dynamic, but the the routing. Um, yeah, I have yeah. Uh, a home page that has a title and a nav bar, and a contact page that has probably like a paragraph and a the same nav bar using a nice. partial, and that's that's pretty easy. Like, I've gotten partials in the layouts. I've, I've used that before. It's been a while, but I, I have used that, so that, and using handlebars, I have used an older version of it a while ago. So that was yeah. okay for me, but the mo- hooking up MongoDB manually is what I'm having trouble with. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You'll, you'll get there. It's, uh, it takes some finagling, but yeah. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then I have to think about Oh, so I'll store my my posts in in Mongo. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, I need to add it to Mongo. Uh, not dev. Do I just log into Compose and paste in a, a JSON object, or do I write a front end for it and do authentication? And yeah, and we just think, what if I just go back to writing a JSON file and store it in the client? Well, yeah. alternatively, you could uh, you could just make your own flat file system too. Yeah, and just call files, or what do you mean? Yeah, so like, uh, what was that um, GitHub Pages flat file blog system, Jekyll, I think? Yeah. Yeah, you could make yeah. something like that all yourself, mm-hmm. and then it could read those files in, turn it into a cache JSON format, and then you can read it out of the JSON format for viewing. Yeah. Yeah, I've thought about doing something like that. And that's kind of, I mean, what I have currently is I have one JSON file that is like a index of all the posts I want. And so if I add a new one to that file, it automatically pulls it into the site. Nice. Yeah. So I just add a new markdown file and another little metadata in the JSON file, and that's up to date. That's awesome. That might be what I end up doing, because skipping MongoDB sounds fun, too. But then I lose my nice... Well, I don't know if I'll rewrite my AngularJS toys that I did. Yeah, Maybe no. Stay in archival, I don't know. Yeah, no, that sounds like a good way to go, totally. And then I can just dive and get it done. And maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll do something more of it later, but for now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I see that uh looks like we've we've probably got a, a good uh a good show going here for the for this week, eh? Yeah, I think so. That's kind of so Minnesotan. I'm just going to say that. Well, you know, I think it's about time we get some Ludafisk and uh and uh <laughs> And pierogi, no, pierogi is not really uniquely Minnesotan. Well, I guess neither is Ludafisk. Anywho, um, <laughs> see, 
See, you thought see, I was going to see. See, you did I, it right this time. I yeah, I uh-huh. vague, vaguely sort of did it right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So what what what's uh what's going on in the next week for you all? Uh, I think I'll be working on rusty stuff and stuff stuff. Mm-hmm. I kind of nice. wanted to do more CMS stuff. I've taken a long enough break from it. I'm ready to go back into it now. Yeah. Uh, I have to do um file uploads and image resizing next. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So that will be yeah. fun. Totally. How about you, Brian? Uh, I'll be working. I have a fairly busy weekend, so I don't know if we'll get to anything. Unfortunately, that's that's kind of how my summer has gone. Yeah, I get you. And then I look forward to the school year when I have quote more time. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. Oh uh, yeah. So how about yeah. you, Brandon? Uh well, let's see. Uh, I've got uh, well, go, I'm going to the big game this weekend. Nice. This game. Very good. I presume it's big. I don't really follow baseball, but eh. um, I enjoy going when I do. Um, so that'll, that'll be quite fun. Are you going to um, periscope the last inning like uh, John Gerber did the other day? That would be awesome. I, I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure that the twins would be on to me. And yeah, I'm sure they'll be sniped from a distance. Totally. It's going to, It's yeah, uh, Bert yep. himself. Yep. I'm told Bert is a person of importance in sports circles. Uh, probably. Um, Bert, Bert himself would be would be holding the, the gun in that Bert? situation. Yeah, he apparently circles one. <laughs> That's that's the extent of my knowledge of of baseball, um, and occasionally, if if somebody if somebody uh, hits hits it really far over the thing far away, it's called a um, a, a hat trick. Uh, right? Is that is that no? right? No. Okay. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I'm not that bad. I know what I'm <laughs> sure. I went to a, a Saints game on Sunday night. Yeah, how was that? It's the first time I've been to a baseball game in years. It was nice. And their new stadium is is it's small, but it's also spacious. So it's it's really it, flat. It, nice. Yes. And the the bunch of seats, but then there's the whole walking area all around, which yeah. is plenty wide and yet flat. And it's nice though. I wish they had one more scoreboard rather than just on one wall. But yeah, yeah, that's in that area over by Union Square, right, Lower Town, yep. kinda. Yep. Oh, or Union Square, Union Depot. Yep. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it, it is. I haven't been in the stadium, but you can see it right next to the farmers market, which I go to all the time. Yeah, and it looks really nice, and it, it feels like a great stadium. And because it's on the train line, I am almost positive more people will go there than when it was in Midway, uh, you know, near the fairgrounds. Oh, it's, totally. It's more in people's faces now, so they're going to think about it and go to it more often. That's Definitely. what I thought. And of course, you know, it's the less serious baseball place than, you know, compared to the, to the twins, you know, they're, they're real. Yeah. The Saints are kind of, you know, have fun. I mean, you can buy a stand up ticket for $5. And yeah. You're good to go. Exactly. What? That's awesome. And you can just bring your own chair, sit somewhere, or just land. There's a little grassy area you can be, or just sit in a chair that no one's sitting in. So that's so nice. That is so cool. Like, yeah. that, uh, yeah. Nice and relaxed. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, I yeah, I'm I'm a big uh, I'm a big rail guy, so it was cool when Union Depot opened, and oh, yeah. now that and now that they've got um now that they have stuff over there, that's not just now crazy. it's off the rails. Ooh. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Too good. Too good. Um. Yeah. Well, where where can we uh where can we find you, Ryan? Where can we find you? Oh, you're gonna start with me first. I'm gonna start with you. Oh well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on the Google Plus, where I post videos of the most absurd things that happen on Android, such as the most intense keyboard leg you've ever seen. Literally, the keyboard, you know, tooltips stay floating. Seconds after I've touched them, it's amazing. You've got to check out the video. You can find on my Google Plus. All right, mm-hmm. nice. I shall go there. How about you, Brian? Going... Yeah. Okay, I'll be next. Uh, you can also find me on the internet, J- just about anywhere, but especially on Twitter at Twitter for seventy nine or Attack for seventy nine, but also on the internet at Brian me or on the Facebook at Bman for seventy nine, uh, or on the GitHub at Bman for seventy nine. Or on Google Plus at I think B Man four seven eight nine. Don't quote me on that though. Yeah. Nice. That was very good. That was very good. Where can we find you, Brandon? Uh well I am at B R A N D O N underscore M 
and that's Brandon Amen, and that's my bad impression of Jonathan Mann. Uh, no, you can literally find me on the Twitters at Brandon underscore Amen, or um, a bunch of other places too, and the quickest way to track those places down is to go to my other website, which is probably more confusingly named, but I think we can work through it, uh, brndn.xyz. All my stuff is linked to you from there. Um, it's like my name, but with no vowels, so you can't get it mixed up with A's or E's or O's. I think that might be more complicated. Yeah, probably. I saw on your website when I was there this weekend looking at Foundation stuff, and I saw since I had been there last weeks and weeks ago, you have a new post at the bottom or a new thing at the bottom saying that Podkit is a thing. Hooray! Yeah, nice. Totally. Yeah, I made that update a couple weeks ago uh, when I was like, oh yeah, I'm using this website as my main page now, so maybe I should like be legit and update it. With some frequency. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Mine hasn't seen updates since uh, probably April, maybe May. That's fine. Yeah. Not a problem. Hey, it's it's all it's all mostly for fun. So exactly. Yeah. If somebody wants to find you, they will. Totally. Yeah. One just way or another. Someone will come running. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You can also just shout my name into. Uh, in, in, in um. Well, if if you're ever in Minneapolis in the Mill District, just start shouting my name. Um. Uh, from the Stone Arch Bridge, and I'll eventually, you know, find my way, emerge from the from the um, briny depths of the Mississippi. Because because um, nobody else is going to be around named Brandon. Yeah, psh, yeah. There's there are only like 500 of me in the, on the Twin Cities campus. At so. least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds good. It's been a great great show today. Uh, yeah. 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 We should do this more. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, next uh, this, this upcoming? Sunday-ish or something like yeah, that? Yeah, sure, something like that. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. That sounds good. All right, well, have a good uh, rest of the week, you all. Yeah, have a good one. See you. Thanks for listening to Podkit. For more, listen to The Fringe and listen to the next episode, too.